The Chinese economy managed to do something no other large economy did in 2020, avoid a full-blown recession. International consensus is that China will grow by about 2%, meaning China will be growing alone. With the world economy in its worst shape since the 1930s, this is honestly a remarkable achievement when you think about it. The economy of China bounced back from a near 7% slump in the first quarter of 2020, which was the biggest contraction since records began in the early 90s. The scale and speed of this recovery took virtually everyone by surprise, including Chinese officials, who scrapped their 2020 economic targets early in the year, at a time when the V-shaped recovery was far from certain. But what you may be wondering is how? If this sounds like something you'd enjoy watching, we release new content each week, so please consider hitting that subscribe button and notification bell. So, what was behind China's quick recovery? Well, on the surface, according to the publicly released data, and make of that what you will, the nation's economic recovery appears to go hand in hand with effective lockdown, testing and containment. And whilst confidence is the foundation of any economy, just take a look at our videos in Turkey or Lebanon to see what happens when confidence evaporates, what you may not know is that China, in contrast to virtually every other country, has come up with some unique solutions to a global crisis which is in part a consequence of its unique economic setup. In the normal run of things, a recession is marked by a gradual slowdown in demand, as opposed to an abrupt halt in both demand and supply. Meaning, conventional economic policies, such as slashing interest rates and stimulus checks, largely demand-side policies, were not an overwhelming part of the response equation. Supply-side policies were just as key. Now, Whilst China was far from the only country to figure this out, the difference is the scale of the intervention and the capacity to implement it. The Chinese state engaged in aggressive intervention. Trillions of yen denominated bonds were issued by provincial authorities for infrastructure spending, alongside loans and direct intervention in companies to ramp up supply and retain jobs. The impact of this has been magnified by China's economic setup. You see, State-owned enterprises are an important component of the economy. As the name suggests, these corporations are owned by the state, a quasi-public entity which competes in the industrial markets, but with the backing of the government. An unfair advantage perhaps, but let's not forget China is technically a communist nation. Though economists are in general agreement that these are inefficient, they operate on such a large scale to impact the macroeconomic landscape. For example, of the world's largest 500 companies, 102 are state-owned enterprises. Out of those, 75 are from China. In fact, there are more than 170,000 state-owned enterprises in China. Crucially, these companies give the government a direct line into the supply side of the economy, something which is being used to boost construction and infrastructure investment in an attempt to build their way out of the global recession. We can tell this strategy is being deployed by comparing the investment data of private to state-owned enterprises. As you'd expect, private investment is down, but state-owned investment is up by about 4%. Now, if you recall the Great Recession, this is familiar territory for China, when ramping up industrial output was used to propel the economy on the back of increasing globalization at the time. Though you might now be wondering, it's all well and good increasing supply, but surely someone needs to be buying this. Excluding the infrastructure spending, the someone is the rest of the world. Whilst it's true that demand has plummeted across the world, if you recall from earlier, so has supply. Across the world, manufacturing output has collapsed, as factories closed, slowed down investment, and made millions unemployed. Importantly, whilst most of the world closed down, China was already opening back up a consequence of experiencing an early first peak. The big win for China here has been their exports, having risen to their highest ever level on record, with the nation accounting for over 18% of global exports at one point in 2020. China has actually been taking market share from others, and you've got to remember, this was in the middle of a global shutdown and trade war. A core reason for this has been the shift in consumer demand towards home working, 
which complements China's manufacturing sectors. The country produces over 90% of mobile phones and computers and over 70% of televisions, according to the Ministry of Industry and Information Technology. Impressive stats for sure, but there's an important problem with China's strategy. So what's China's strategy problem? Ultimately, many economists have called their over-reliance on supply-side expansion dangerously unbalanced. Especially in the longer term, sure, China's rise to become the second largest economy on Earth was driven by industrial output and exports. Though the real concern is unsustainable supply relative to underwhelming domestic demand. In light of this unsustainable supply, the country has few options. Chinese firms have been racking up large piles of debt, especially its state-owned enterprises, through overinvestment relative to demand. In addition to mounting debts, export markets have acted like a pressure release valve. The trouble is, high export levels weaken the wider global recovery with international concerns about the overdependence on Chinese supply chains. This means stronger growth in exports can no longer be relied upon for long-term sustainable expansion within China. If we were to consider basic economic principles of supply and demand constraints, economists have come to the conclusion that the real issue is demand, something the Chinese government has acknowledged. Hence, over the last few years, China has been desperately trying to rebalance its economy towards consumerism, and until 2020, progress was being made. Yet, old habits die hard. To really put the scale of this imbalance in context, domestic consumption accounts for less than 40% of the economy, which is below the typical 65% of advanced economies. One of the best examples of demand-side problems is highlighted by China's National Golden Week. This is an eight-day holiday held in the autumn, which is often seen as a barometer of consumer demand. Unsurprisingly, tourism spending over the eight-day holiday is estimated to have been 30% down on last year, a sharp drop which can be explained by the same issues impacting the rest of the world. But the point is, it just goes to highlight how imbalanced China's recovery in favour of supply has been so far. Now, you can imagine the nation has a strategy to deal with this, which leads us very nicely onto the next section. What's China's longer term solution? Rising geopolitical tensions with its trading partners and an imbalance away from domestic demand have led President Xi Jinping to launch a new model, one he has termed dual circulation. Widely heralded by state media as a new model for growth, this essentially entails greater focus on increasing domestic demand. Policies are being enacted to stimulate consumption amongst Chinese citizens for the longer term, to help counteract external pressures and the shocks which come with trade disputes. The thinking is that this will finally address China's demand side constraints we mentioned earlier, helping to create self-sustaining domestic growth. Though note, this new policy is one of dual circulation, with the nation not intending to pursue total self-sufficiency or to give up its lucrative export markets easily. So we can consider this to be more like adding another string to the made in China bow. Crucially, a huge incentive is China's vast domestic market, possessing a burgeoning middle class which is finally getting to the stage where it can support more of the economy. However, such a policy shift will require large transfers of wealth down the economic line to the household level, a transfer which will need to be carefully managed to maintain the social stability the state requires to function, a challenge compounded by a nation synonymous for having one of the highest saving rates in the world, which the IMF reportedly puts at 46% of GDP. A hard challenge to overcome, but if 2020 is anything to go by, one which the nation has a high chance of overcoming. So overall, we've seen that China, being the only major economy to avoid recession, is the product of substantial state intervention. Something facilitated through the significant role state-owned enterprises play in the economy. Rising supply has been met through a growing share of world exports, at a time when other international suppliers were heavily restricted. Though this reliance on export markets is not a long-term fix, more a short-term solution. Concerns are mounting over unsustainable supply relative to weak demand, 
leading to rising company debts and dependency on an export market which is increasingly fragile. To counter this, China has proposed a new model, one of dual circulation to raise domestic demand. Though whether this new model can overcome a culture of high saving and limited spending will be key to its success. Now we want to hear what your thoughts are. Do you believe in the data? Is China's export-led growth sustainable? Or will dual circulation propel its economy onto a more secure footing? Let us know in the comments below. The Alt Simplified team hope you've enjoyed this video. And if you did, please consider hitting that subscribe button and leaving a like. It really helps grow this channel. As always, see you in the next video.